I uh, left my notes for the lecture here uh, on Wednesday and um, I thought I'd taken them home and I spent most of last night uh, looking for them among many stacks of papers that I <laughs> had in my office at home. Uh, the perils of mathematicians, I'm sure you guys have had such experiences as well. So, um, uh, this will be, how should I call this? This is, I think I, I talked about the sort of a syllabus for the course uh, consisting of um, an introduction. And uh, perhaps we can, I can call what I'm about to talk about uh, um, uh, L functions and the Langlands program, but it's just a very, um, um, how should I say, it's just a very, um, well, I hope to describe the essence of it, but uh, it's rather superficial in some sense, and I will go back for the, perhaps the third part of the course to be, fill in these ideas a little bit more. So why don't, I'm going to, I've entitled this as L functions, since we did art and L functions, let's call this L functions and the Langlands program. So this would be, I suppose, this would be the second uh, section of the course. And maybe I don't go below here. I guess I, is this, is this visible up here? Yes. So I don't, maybe don't go below that. Well, the Langlands program is based on something that uh, it was not named in that, it didn't have a name in that 1969 Bachner article. Uh, the name only came later, um, uh, but it, it was the name automorphic representations. So the notion of an automorphic form, this is just an aside, but the notion of an automorphic form is familiar from the subject of modular forms. And there is a difference, a little bit of a difference between a modular form, an automorphic form and an automorphic representation. An automorphic representation is a representation of a group, a big group. An automorphic form, roughly speaking, is a matrix coefficient of that representation a function on the group that um, has uh, might, might be an eigenfunction of some differential operator, a very uh, important kind of function, but it's not the representation, it's, it's like a matrix coefficient of that representation. And uh, there's an art, in fact, there's an article of Langlands. It's, it's important, I think, to keep track of, I mean, especially when one works in the subject, it's important to keep track of the differences between those two notions, an automorphic form and an automorphic representation. And uh, there is an article by Langlands in the 1977 Corvallis Proceedings, uh, just a short article, like about eight pages, but it's quite, actually, it's quite, um, like anything, it's quite dense, but explaining the difference between the two things and the two ways in which they could be constructed, one way that's special for automorphic forms and one way that's special for automorphic representations, and then a proof of the fact that they amount to the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's a theorem. So I'm not, not sort of describing what, all, what that means, but just this Automorphic form had been defined at the time of Langland's article, especially when in the form of a modular, the modular form, which is an automorphic form for the group SL2. But uh, this term it had not been defined. But it, so let's say what they are. So uh, I'll say the general uh, situation. G is a reductive algebraic group. And, start off for simplicity, let me just say a split reductive algebraic group, and we'll make it defined over Q. So um, uh, uh, an algebraic group is like a Lie group, 
except it's defined by algebraic equations. It's an algebraic variety with a multiplication on it, but it uh, makes it seem too forbidding. It's, it's just um, all of the things that um, one is familiar with if one knows uh, semi-simple Lie groups. Uh, a reductive one, by the way, is a semi-simple one, the direct product of a semi-simple one with an abelian one, that's a slight generalization. Split means that it has a maximal abelian subgroup, which is defined over Q. So uh, many groups, uh, if you're thinking of Lie groups rather than algebraic groups, many Lie groups are compact, like unitary groups, but they're not, I mean, they're also, they, most, most semi-simple Lie groups are also and, um, ending up being the real points of an algebraic group. So the two are more or less the same, um, uh, but uh, a co compact Lie group, like a, a unitary group, um, doesn't, it's not split because it doesn't have a maximal, so split means it has a maximal torus, which is to say a maximal abelian subgroup, which is split, and a maximal torus is just a product of GL1s <clears throat> or GMs. I, I may be saying things that are, you may not be familiar with, but it's uh, um, split is the opposite to being compact. It's as most non-compact as possible. And they're uh, sort of an important thing to be working with because you see everything happening, um, it, perhaps in its simplest form for these split groups. So I'm not really defining that if I, so, but bear with me. Um, one can just, for example, if one's not familiar with sort of the ideas of algebraic groups, um, um, algebraic groups, I was once told uh, by a senior advisor that algebraic groups, I said, you know, well, you gotta learn algebraic groups to get into this stuff. I mean, that's a, already a huge thing and they're just the background. It was Langlands actually, and he, he said, well, it doesn't matter. Algebraic group is just a subject with a bunch of lemmas in it. All you have to do is just learn what the lemmas, lemmas mean and memorize the lemmas. You don't, you don't have to take a year off to learn what algebraic groups are, and especially if you know something about Lie groups. So it's not a, not a big deal, according to some people. Um, so, but in any case, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, um, one can just take and, and you don't go at all, really at all wrong, just saying, thinking of G as the general linear group. So that's the group of N by N matrices with non-zero determinant and group under matrix multiplication. Now, what, uh, what is really important is what Langlands introduced in this article. Um, uh, it, this notation is, and the language came later. I think it might have been due to Kotwitz. Uh, Langlands talked about an associated group, um, but attached to such a thing, Langlands introduced another group, which people usually call G hat. And this is what's known as the complex dual group. So attached to this, this is what, this is the object on which everything is going to be happening. But this is something that Langlands introduced. Complex, um, it, turned, it was a complex group. So in this case, um, G hat is the same group. It's G, L, N, C, but it's a group of complex points. Whereas this is just an algebraic group where you could put any kind of field entries into it. And um, there's lots of other examples uh, that are more, um, uh, interesting. Um, so you could have G and G hat. You could have G being SP 2N and then G hat, I'll, I'll, then I'll just say a couple of words about how this is defined, but G is equal to SP 2N, uh, G hat is the complex group that is S O two N plus one C this is complex points or G could be S O two N plus one as an algebraic group and G hat would be the other way around 
that would be sp uh, 2n, let's see. And then if uh, you had an even orthogonal group, SO2n, g hat is SO2n itself, C. And then maybe one other. So if, if um, G was equal to SLN, then G hat would be PGLNC. And the other way around, uh, if G was equal to PGLNC, uh, PGL, excuse me, is an algebraic group, then G hat would be um, um, SLNC. So this is a fundamental construction that Langlands introduced right at the beginning of that article, <clears throat> called it an associate group, associated group, I think. Um, G hat, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Pardon me? Is there a reason you include the coefficients like the, on one side? On the G you mean the complex numbers? Right. Yes, yes. It's, um, so, so what's happening is that G as an algebraic group, there's a lot of stuff you can put into it. You can talk about the real points of it, the piadic points, or the adelic points, things that I'll mention presently. Um, but, uh, and you want to attach representations to those locally compact groups that you get by putting in entries. But uh, the glory, I mean, the, the wonder of the Langlands program, one of the many wondrous things about it is that those, you're interested in the classification of those representations, and they, like uh, Fourier series and Fourier analysis, um, they have um, complex parameters. The, the part of his conjectures was that there were certain complex parameters, which he outlined quite clearly, um, which parameterize the objects that you want to attach to these groups. And the complex parameters live in this group. So it's like if you were um, thinking of um, the torus, um, uh, just G, um, uh, um, it's as if you were thinking of, I'm not making clear why you want to choose complex parameters for the group. Maybe I'm just going to leave that open. So this is the, the, the um, this, I, what I perhaps should say is how you get this from this. And um, there's a precise construction in Langland's article, but the two things are happening. One is that uh, if this is a group given by a Dinkin diagram, this is a corresponding group given by the dual Dinkin diagram, uh, uh, Dinkin-Coxeter diagram. If this is given by a simply connected group, this is given by an adjoint group, and other way around. If this is given by an adjoint group, this is a simply connected group. And that's not the definition of these things. Uh, the definition of the little more. Oh, yes, yes. That, that's right. Yes, yes. I'm so uh, reductive. Uh, yes, thanks. That's a good point. A reductive. So reductive is just semi simple plus. Uh, 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 times uh, uh, commuting algebra, uh, 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 torus. So will the center also be reflected in the... Yes. In case there is a center. That's, that's what's happening if this is, if, you're if this is a simply connected group. Oh, but then there is no center. Uh, that's right, but then this has a center. You flip, you flip them. Uh, you flip them. If this is an odd joint group, you do have a center, but then this has got to be bigger. That's the. Torus, a torus. So the, the dual, uh, so will G hat have a torus in it, and it will be the dual torus to the torus. There's a notion of a dual torus, given any algebraic torus, <clears throat> there's a notion of a dual torus. And that's more, that's closer to the defini actual definition of the dual group. Um, so anyway, that's what, uh, those are the objects that 
are relevant. And specifically, what you want to do, the um, um, object that you want to attach to G that gives the, uh, the, the ingredients of the Langlands program is that what you can do is to take G, Q, the rational points in this group, that'd be like the G, L, and Q. Now, um, that doesn't look uh, um, very, so, so this is what, this is really, at this stage, it's kind of a branch of analysis. It's a branch of harmonic analysis that we are thinking of. And this is to be regarded as a discrete subgroup. It doesn't look very discrete. Um, it, of uh, the group of Adele's. So this is a locally compact group. And this is a discrete subgroup of this. So I'll just say that uh, this is not, this looks rather, um, um, this is why people didn't like Langland's article. I, I mean, why they, they weren't used to talking about Adele's. It's just, a, it's just a little bit of a language for these things. This is very closely related. Well, before I, uh, uh, so it, this is like, and it doesn't seem plausible what I'm about to say, but it's very much like where you take GZ, G, GZ, sitting in GR where this is a discrete subgroup of this locally compact so this and the typical example of this would be um, SL2Z let's leave aside as to how we choose a lattice in the group uh, but um, uh, uh, we are thinking of objects in which there is a lattice, um, and that's sitting inside SL2Z. And so this is, uh, excuse me, SL2R. So this is like the upper half plane modulo SL, uh, which contain, uh, it's like the, uh, the, the quotient of this by this, which we're going to form, uh, especially in this situation, is like the quotient of the upper half plane by SL2Z. Now, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with this, that's fine. It's not, a, it's not an issue. Um, there's three, two steps to get from the upper half plane. So I don't know whether to write this down, um, but maybe I should say like this, what one wants to consider is um, Um, I should, perhaps should say that the uh, G of the Adels is, and, and so I'm, I, I will explain this perhaps a little more in the sort of, sort of when we get to saying a little bit more about what these objects are. Um, um, uh, so you, perhaps if you're not familiar with it, perhaps just we take it for granted. This by definition is GR, a group of real points times something that's almost a compact group. It's the product over all p addicts, um, but are what so called restricted direct product um, of GP. So maybe I'll say this in more detail later, but I'd like to uh, get on to the actual Langlands program. The p addict uh, numbers are the, uh, the rational numbers. Are the completion of the rational numbers with respect to the usual absolute value. Um, the p-adic numbers are the completion of the rational numbers with another absolute value, um, which re re reflects uh, the divisibility. Um, uh, so I won't write this down, but the divisibility of a rational number by p. If there's a p in the numerator and not a p in the denominator, then the p adic absolute value is very close to uh, um, zero, uh, p close to one. Uh, no, close to zero. The absolute value of p is small. 
So um, the, ab the p adic absolute value is an absolute value which reflects not the length in the usual sense, but in the divisibility of a rational number by p, either in the numerator or the denominator. If it's um, highly divisible in its denominator, a rational number by p, it means its p adic absolute value is very large. If it's, um, uh, if it's highly divisible in the numerator, it means its p adic absolute value is very close to zero. If p doesn't divide either the denominator or the numerator, it means its, ab its p adic absolute value is one. Uh, that may just, if you're not used to it, it, may confuse it even more. But the point is that um, um, uh, this is, there's another absolute value on the rational numbers, not the usual one, which, ref which is very important for number theory and reflects the divisibility of a given rational number by a prime p. So p is, the fig p is going to vary over all primes, and one would take the completion um, uh, of g, the g over the rationals with respect to this completion field qp. And this, uh, each of these groups is locally compact. Um, so, uh, but if you take an infinite product of locally compact groups that are not compact, you're not going to get a locally compact group. And uh, the only way to get a locally compact group is to take um, finitely many products of locally compact groups. And what this means is the so-called restricted direct product, where by elements in here, uh, elements in this product over all primes of these locally compact, non-compact groups are, you ask that almost all of them to be an element in this restricted direct product, you ask that for almost all primes P, this actually lies in the maximal compact subgroup. Um, I hope I haven't confused this more so. It'd be, uh, but this is, this is the group of p-adic integers. This is a compact group. And this is a locally compact group. Um, uh, so um, uh, um, the, uh, the elements in here consist of products of, uh, over all p of elements in these groups with the restriction that almost all of them have to lie in this. Almost for, for, for any given element, um, you're talking about an element in the product of all of uh, an element in the product of all of these things such that almost all of the components are in this compact group. And then this is the direct limit of uh, these things. So it turns out it has slightly stronger topology, which makes it locally compact. So is that, I mean, if you're familiar with this, it's no problem at all. Uh, if you're not, uh, well, I'll say is, uh, some more words, perhaps I hope will be a little clearer uh, presently. But in any, but the upshot of all of this is, I mean, you could have been working just with this. You'd, you'd have to choose subgroups of this, like congruent subgroups, um, to really get all of the information. And you would take the GR modulo a congruent subgroup, um, uh, and that gives almost all of the information that you get from this. Uh, that is, what's of interest is, um, um, what is of interest is to take this object, this locally compact group, take this discrete subgroup of it, form the quotient, by cosets, and then take, there's a natural measure on this thing, given by the restriction or by the projection of the Haar measure on GA, to, um, to, be low, to be reductive means that the, it has a Haar measure, uh, and in fact, the, the, the left Haar measure on GA is the same as the right Haar measure. So there's a canonical measure up to a scalar on GA, 
you can take the corresponding measure on this modulo this discrete subgroup and you can form the L2 functions on that quotient. Now that's very much like, in fact, it almost is the same as taking the direct limit um, over of, um, so this is almost the same as, um, excuse me, uh, as the direct limit of L2 of gamma of N, um, uh, G, uh, SL2. It, um, if it's almost the same in the case, it is, it's exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> I just really didn't sleep very well last night. I'm getting, I get confused and, uh, <laughs> or get ragged here. So uh, if, if G is equal to SL2, this is the same as uh, not SL2. Um, so I'm sorry, we'll rub that off. This, uh, this thing here is the same as the um, direct limit as n gets larger and larger of SL to R modulo gamma n, gamma n being um, the direct limit as n goes to infinity of L2 of this quotient um, this being a congruent subgroup, this would be the set of matrices A, B, C, D. Um, so this would be the set of matrices alpha, A, B, C, D in SL to Z, such that alpha is congruent to one mod N. Now, it may not look like what we're doing here, that this is the same as this, but it really is um, uh, because uh, simply by the fact that you're taking, this would be a direct limit um, over all n um, of quotients of, uh, uh, well, it follows, it follows really from the definitions that this in the case of SL2 is the same as this. Doesn't look like it, but it is. The point is though, having Adele's um, at the places, it kind of thickens it and makes it more easy for you to keep track of what's really happening when you start to consider the representation theory of this. And in particular, the HECA operators, especially at the unramified places as they uh, um, act on this. Um, HECA operators, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, um, uh, are natural things that occur here. They're, they're very important and, and relatively simple to, to describe, to define, um, but uh, when they're unramified, um, which would be the case for almost all P um, uh, for a given element in here, but when they ramified, well, they gave, they gave the classical modular forms people all kinds of trouble, uh, the ramified P, uh, HECA operators. Uh, that's what's happened. That's like what's happening when P divides S, uh, that this set of primes that we throw away uh, that we've been talking about. Um, and it, the point is that the adelic picture makes it quite clear what's happening uh, in the case uh, of ramified primes. Um, um, uh, so um, uh, this, this for, for a simply connected group, this, the analog of this is exactly the same as this. And that doesn't quite get it for why that is the same or why this is the same 
as the upper half plane. Um, well, what, uh, the, this is very closely related to the upper half plane modulo gamma of n, L2 of this, because that's essentially the same as L2 of the upper half plane, SL2R, modulo SO2. R, the maximal compact subgroup. So this is the same as this. And so, um, uh, so this uh, is a cover of the, uh, the, um, the space of this is a cover of this space. Um, and then, but in fact, um, so in fact, what one using it, using this instead of this, excuse me, <laughs> Using, using this instead of this uh, gives you more flexibility. It allows you to talk about vector bundles, um, line bundles on this space by choosing a representation of this. And um, that has a, a, an immediate um, um, description, uh, equivalent description in terms of what we're about to talk about, namely the representations of the group SL2R or better, the group SL2A, um, which occur in this. There's a very uh, uh, reasonably clear article. Um, so th there's really two steps, uh, which I uh, should have described more, more, more uh, in a more um, uh, uh, ordered way. But there's really two steps to get from classical modular forms, which is what we're talking about here, to get to automorphic forms, which is what we're talking about here. One, you go from the upper half plane, modulo a discrete subgroup, to SL2R, modulo the discrete subgroup, with the understanding that putting this thing in here, or possibly choosing equivariant functions on the right with respect to a representation of this abelian group, um, uh, gives you more flexibility by allowing you to talk about vector bundles on this thing, or line bundles in this case. So it's uh, this is the this is what classical modular forms people deal with. This uh, gives you more flexibility. There's more information there that you can study, and then this uh, is the same as this, but this make there's more information that's immediately uh, visible on this thing because there's all the p-adic places that are uh, there. So, um, um, so with that, uh, <laughs> with that description, I don't, um, uh, it's all to persuade you, if you're familiar with this, then it's, you don't need any persuasion, but it's all to persuade you that this is really uh, what's uh, going on and what you want to understand and what's the foundation of the new things that became the Langlands program. And they are as follows. Any, any questions? Any queries? Um, yes. Uh, this one? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, it makes no sense whatsoever what I wrote. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry about that. That's the congruence. The one on the left is, is uh, contained in SL2Z, yes. Any, any other question? Okay, so now we've got an informal definition. We've got our um, reductive algebraic group over Q, split algebraic group over Q. And so we're going to define an automorphic representation. Of G is an irreducible representation 
So um, this is actually a little bit restricted from to the from the general uh, um, definition. It's first of all an irreducible. unitary representation, let's say pi, they, these things always get used to being called pi, small pi, which makes it confusing when you have uh, e to the two pi i, but people seem to be able to keep it straight, as pi is usually the uh, no, often the notation for an irreducible representation. So it's an irreducible representation of GA. GA is a locally compact group. It's quite uh, natural to talk about its irreducible unitary representations. So it's an irreducible unitary representation of GA that occurs in L2 GQ over GA. i.e. an irreducible constituent of uh, the highly reducible representation given by the regular representation of GA on this of the regular representation R of GA on L2 GQ, left coset uh, uh, on the left, GA. In other words, we're just talking about uh, um, the representation. So in other words, R of Y is the unitary operator on this Hilbert space. Uh, R of Y is the unitary, is the, um, is the unitary operator on that space, which takes any function phi in L2, GQ, GA. Uh, so it maps any function here, phi, to the new function in the same space whose value at x is simply R of Y x. So the x in um, uh, uh, Y would be in GA. And I guess you'd have to say X was in GQ. GA. And so that uh, is immediately clear that that's a unitary representation because you're using the Har measure, the, the, the right invariant measure and le right and left invariant measure uh, to define L2, the L2 functions. And um, uh, uh, it's, so it's a unitary, it's a, it's a very large unitary representation. It's highly reducible. And there are lots of irreducible representations in it. And those irreducible representations are what we would call, we call automorphic representations. Now, this is not quite the definition. The definition is a little bit more technical. This is slightly for two reasons. So this is just, a, a, it, it really captures the essence of what we're looking for, slightly imprecise. And why is that? Uh, well, uh, it's very interesting. Um, um, the decomposition of this, uh, of R, into irreducible representations, which there's general theorem, theorems of Mackey and, uh, well, really Mackey. Um, uh, this is a type one group, group in the language of Mackey. 
which means that there is a canonical decomposition of any unitary representation of that group um, into irreducible representation. So there's, there's background theor theorems that say that this is this notion is, is perfectly well defined, but it's slightly imprecise in that there is a continuous, the decomposition um, into irreducible representations has both the continuous spectrum in general and a discrete and a discrete spectrum. So the word spectrum um, is has sort of uh, been taken over in this situation to mean uh, decomposition. Uh, the spectral decomposition is uh, what we're talking about here uh, into irreducible representations. And it's a perfectly natural thing. There are some there are differential operators uh, that um, are acting on the smooth functions in our in L2 or the, the Schwartz functions in L2 of GA over GQ. And uh, they um, the irreducible representations diagonalize them. So it really is, there really is spectrum. The parameters that give these things really has to do with spectrum. But I should say that there's a, in general, there's a continuous, in this decomposition, there's both a continuous spectrum and a discrete spectrum. So uh, we all know, uh, even if we're not used to these terms, we all know uh, the qualitative phenomena that's going on here. This is like theory of Fourier series excuse me, a Fourier transforms. And this is like the theory of Fourier series, a part that decomposes discreetly, and this is a part that decomposes continuously. But unlike Fourier series and Fourier transforms, they both can happen together. In, and they both do, in general, happen together uh, on this, uh, for this decomposition. And um, this is much, much, which is much more difficult. I, I'm, I'm giving a sort of impressionistic, throwing we're impressionistic words around, but they perhaps, I hope, give an idea of what's really going on that we will be talking about in more detail later, the discrete spectrum is the deepest part. Um, what made Langlands famous before he introduced the Langlands program was an extraordinary uh, um, article uh, in its own right. What he did was he explicitly gave a construction of the continuous spectrum in L2 of GA over GQ. He didn't write Adele's. He just wrote a real group modulo, a discrete subgroup. Yes. Pardon me? Um, um, no, I'm getting to that. The Langlands parameters are what's in G hat. They're what's in G hat. I, I guess you could say, well, I guess uh, they, they um, oh, I'm sorry, is, is, uh, the things that parametrize this decomposition are the Langlands parameters. They are the Langlands parameters. So, okay, so I guess that's, that's um, but th they didn't have that sort of um, interpretation at this early thing. This was done, a complete decomposition of the continuous part of R um, was, uh, this is Langlands. So uh, this was an extraordinary breakthrough actually. This was uh, maybe around 1964 before he did uh, introduce the Langlands uh, program or what became the Langlands program. And what um, governs this thing is called Eisenstein series. Um, uh, Eisenstein series were introduced by Langlands. They'd been studied before by Selberg, uh, I guess following uh, original definitions by Eisenstein. Um, but 
the Eisenstein series are functions of two variables, which uh, one could spend more time saying what these are and what Langlands did here. But uh, the Eisenstein series are functions of two variables, which um, in, in this more elaborate situation, which are exactly at the analogs of e the function e to the i x lambda, say in the theory of Fourier transforms, lambda being a continuous variable, e to the i x lambda, x being a spatial variable, and lambda being a spectral variable in the theory of Fourier transforms. And Eisenstein series are exactly those things in this more general context. And so uh, uh, if we get far enough, they would have to be uh, described more precisely um, if, in, if, if, when, if and when we get to the trace formula, uh, because the trace formula, there isn't going to be any trace if there's a continuous spectrum. And uh, what one has to do in that case is to subtract away the continuous spectrum uh, in order to understand what the trace would be on the discrete spectrum. Um, I'm just throwing a whole bunch of stuff out here, but um, the continuous spectrum was very important for that uh, purpose. But what Langlands did was um, Eisenstein series and a complete description of the continuous spectrum modulo something, modulo complete decomposition modulo discrete spectra for proper for certain proper subgroups for proper the, the word for this would be levy subgroups for proper levy subgroups m of g more precisely there um, um, a split group has a very important class of subgroups called parabolic subgroups and the levy components of parabolic subgroups are these groups M. They were for proper subgroups, which is what Langlands has here. Um, it's the discrete spectrum on these things, but made uh, with stuff added to it to make them occur continuously that Langlands um, give Langlands continuous spectrum. So another way to say it is he gave a complete explicit decomposition um, of the continuous spectrum in terms of discrete spectra of smaller groups. So it just puts all, everything on, into the lap of discrete spectra. They are the deep things. Okay, so that's why, uh, so there's two reasons why this is slightly imprecise. Some people, when, when they see it at first, you know, what does it mean to have a continuous spectrum? But it's just like the theory of Fourier series, and one has to be aware that there, in general, there's, if you're talking about an irreducible representation, the, the reason it's imprecise is uh, I'm using occurs in so it's not a sub-representation, it's just something that occurs continuously in a sense that uh, I guess is intuitively uh, clear, but um, uh, so it's slightly imprecise. You have to make, make that precise to make it precise. What, what do you mean by saying that it occurs in that? And uh, it, it's easy to do that. And it, um, for example, George Mackey, um, described that sort of phenomenon uh, in terms of what he called a direct integral as opposed to, dir uh, to a direct sum of irreducible representations. So I think it's intuitively clear what's happening there. So it's the discrete spectrum that one is really interested in. And what are we, what are we thinking of? Um, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Well, I'll just add one further thing. There were two reasons why this is slightly imprecise. First of all, you've got a continuous spectrum as well as a discrete spectrum. And secondly, uh, the notion of unitary is, I've, I've asked that it be unitary, and um, um, the, def the actual definition of automorphic representation 
um, is, uh, allows a little bit more. Um, it's, so it's slightly imprecise for the reason of a, of a continuous spectrum and slightly restricted in that uh, does not allow for, sometimes the theory actually requires you to consider non-unitary representations, uh, does not allow for non-unitary representations. And if you look at Langland's definition of an automorphic representation, uh, you, you, it, they, um, these, th these non-unitary things have to be allowed. Non-unitary uh, representations, um, um, i.e. given by uh, analytic, well, given by, um, uh, uh, rather than say what these are, I'll just say um, um, analogs of one-dimensional representations e to the i, um, um, uh, let's say, zeta of x, where x is a real number, but rather than zeta being real, um, it's the analog of this thing, where zeta is complex rather than just real. So uh, here we do in uh, analogs of these representations in the theory of Fourier transforms. All right, so Fourier transforms, you have e to the i lambda of x, that's how you define a Fourier transform, and it gives a direct integral of the regular representation of the additive group of reals um, uh, into irreducible unitary representations. But if you were to choose lambda, if you were to, to choose the spectral variable c not to be purely real, but to have an imaginary part, this would make this thing non-unitary. Uh, but it turns out that analogs of that in automorphic representations really do have to be considered, and they're part of the story. So uh, that's why the definition of a, of a automorphic representation includes analogs of these things. And so that's why this definition that I gave is slightly restrictive, as well as being slightly imprecise. Anyway, those are that's those that's the stuff of the Langlands program, and we'll we'll do that on next week. Yeah. Why, why is there um, focus on the regular representation? Why do we look at representations occurring in this specific representation? Because if you just took representations of the piadic groups or the real groups, they'd be interesting enough. But what really makes them interesting is what happens to their parameters, the objects that parameterize them, when you ask that they occur in L2 of G A modulo GQ, that they be that their product be left invariant under GQ. Right. So, so what I mean is like you're you're picking a specific representation of G A mod G Q. G uh, of G A actually. Uh, of G A. Yes. And, and uh, what, why choose the why choose the regular Oh, that's done for that's just what's given to us. That's what that's what nature gives us. That's that's where all of the arithmetic information lives. It lives in the uh, res, res, let's say recip, reciprocity um, relations, whatever they may be, between the piadic pieces the, for different p and the real piece that, that parameterize the representations. If you ask that that product be a representation of, in G A mod G gamma. Asking that they uh, be invariant under G Q imposes severe and deep arithmetic conditions on the parameters of all the constituents. So that's why it's, all, it's already very interesting to just classify the local representations, but the, these, that, that's, a, yeah. Yeah, there isn't a discrete spectrum. Okay. Yeah. So, so you take. If you recall, sometimes they don't. The homotopies don't just quotient out by GQ, but also maybe that's some part of the 
Yeah. You can, so you can, that's right. Uh, you can do, um, it, it's, it's a minor difficulty um, it, because it's an, uh, the center is going to be an abelian group, but if it's non-compact, there's no, there's, uh, for a sort of uh, trivial reasons, there's not, there are no, there's no discrete spectrum. Um, uh, so you got to, you could have to perhaps choose a character uh, in, in the central uh, variable or maybe choose a sub represent a natural sub representation of that but but that's you're quite right yeah yeah should it be oh i'm sorry <laughs> sorry thank you yes yes of course pardon me R Y um, uh, yes it should be uh, X Y thank you <laughs> yes and one checks one checks that this is a representation it's a half a line proof to show that that's a representation and it's a one line proof to show it's unitary okay we'll um, meet again on Monday.